Thanks very much, Kit. Um, so I've reduced the title of my talk a little bit there, but I still want you to think about it in two or at two levels. So you know the uh, the information that a, a grower needs to effectively manage soil acidity on each of his paddocks, but also the information that we all need to recognise it as a as a problem and to give it some of the priorities that uh, I think it deserves. And hopefully, after I've shown you some of the results out of our current uh, Caring for Our Country pro project that we've been doing in uh, partnership with Precision Soil Tech, um, those results show how widespread and just what an impact it is. Um, I'm pleased to say the GRDC are talking to us about uh, you know, funding soil acidity, mainly extension, but also you know, getting sort of practice change happening for probably the next five years. And uh, one of the things that they're charging that project with is to double the, line, the amount of line that's going out. So again, while I'm talking and um, considering it, perhaps you can all sort of think about um, ways that that might be achieved because that's not going to be a simple ask. Um, it, won't, it certainly won't mean just a doubling of uh, the current approach to, to uh, managing soil acidity. Probably for this audience, you're well aware that uh, you know over the last decade or so, it seems to have been a, a drying and warming climate, and um, other talks have shown us that. Just to put in perspective, um, um, Mark Sweetingham told us the other day that it's estimated around about $500 million a year is lost in lost production due to soil acidity. Um, and I guess what the, the important thing is that uh, if, if we are having contractions of, of rainfall and we're then putting a lot more pressure on this medium rainfall zone to make sure that the water that we do have um, is used most effectively. So we want to remove the constraints, things that Yvette was talking about the other day and she'll probably talk about in the next talk as well. So as I've already said, I want to talk about uh, the, the process of the pro or the project that we've had with Caring for Our Country, which really started back in 2006. So, um, but the latest one has been over the last few years. The priorities are really to make sure that we get some practice change at a grower level. But we've been able to use the information that's been gained from that and the information from Precision Soil Tech in terms of uh, data about pH of samples across the wheat belt um, for other purposes as well. So there we have Precision Soil Tech and that's the sampling mechanism that we've been using over the entire wheat belt geocoded soil samples um, and I guess they use contractors, they use the same machinery. So we've been able to have a good degree of confidence of the information that we've been gathering. The state government or the department's contribution in there as well in terms of what I'm going to talk about is the um, quite detailed soil mapping um, information that we have uh, across the wheat belt. And, so to take that soil mapping, it's in this case here, it's been simplified down to 18 major soil types, just shown in different colours there. Um, and those soil types are then broken up into 11 agroecological zones. So zones of similar sort of climate, similar behaviour, similar groupings of soils. And for today, I've just chosen to um, talk about this central northern wheat belt it's called within these agroecological zones. And the dots on here are the, uh, the sample points that I'm going to talk about. And I'm going to just zoom into that small area there. And you can start to see you know, shapes of farms, shapes of areas um, over on, on the map here that we're, that we're looking at. For you guys over there, you know, different soil types. And if I now just zoom in, um, just taking it down a little bit smaller. So you can actually see the individual dots over there. Um, you can see the individual dots. Uh, each of the samples that have been taken, what we've done is look at what their pHs are and apportion them to the soil types within the zones and we now come up with an understanding um, of, of what we've got. So 100% of the uh, soil samples, if we look at it out of that zone, for all of the samples that have come out of there um, from 2005 to 2012, we've got 65% uh, of them have got a pH less than our target of 5.5. Now that target is important um, because if we don't keep the soil at and above that level, 
then subsurface acidity is going to continue and there's going to be no movement of lime out of that surface area to treat the subsurface layers. So if you look at the, the pH, and we have a pH target of 4.8 when we're looking at the 10 to 20 and the 20 to 30 centimetre layers, um, that's to give us some idea of what that profile looks like. Um, they both, for all soils, have about 50% of the samples that have been collected coming back below the target. So that means that there is some impact of subsurface acidity on that 50%. If we then go a step further and just take the major soils out of that soil zone that I've been talking about and look at the sandy earths, we can see that almost three quarters of the surface samples um, come back with a pH less than the, uh, the target that we'd be aiming for. And also on those sandy soils, the number of samples or the proportion of samples from the 10 to 20 and 20 to 30 centimetre layers below the target of 4.8 increases to 65 to 70%. So that shows us that there are clear differences, which we know between soil types, but it shows that this method of surveying and understanding the current figures um, lets us uh, target things, different actions and different, um, different management practices to different uh, soil types. Now, this is broken up over that whole region for many growers. Breaking up within a paddock is actually an important way of doing it. So knowing what the soil pH profiles on different soil types within a paddock can lead to what I talked about at the beginning, more effective um, use of the lime that is being spread. Obviously, if you look at some of the uh, other soils there, clays and shallow loamy duplexes or the deep loamy duplexes and earths, Within there, there is a mixture of different things. The, the clays and shallow loamy duplexes will be um, sandy textured on the surface, and again, over 70% of the top soil samples in that one were coming back uh, below our target. But obviously, with the different soil type in the duplex in the, those deeper depths, there was um, somewhere somewhat a little bit less numbers of samples coming back um, with pH below those targets. So I think this is important information and it's highlighted in terms of what uh, the growers need to know and how they can react. This map shows, um, is a sort of precursor to the next few that I'm going to show where we've used all of the, the detail from that's come out of this study and also um, being able to access the information from other samples as well. So looking at those samples from 2005 2000 to 2012, in our data set that we've been able to investigate, there's just over 93,000 sites across the um, southwest. And what we've done is look at how many samples we had in each of the soil polygons, and then look at, on an average, how much do hectares does each of these samples represent. So the darker green colour shows that I can just, sorry. The darker green colour shows that, you know, uh, each sample represents less than 200 hectares, which is sort of pretty intensive sampling for this size sort of mapping. Um, the moderate green colour, which is most of the rest of the area there, um, each sample represents between 200 to 1,000 hectares. And then the light green is uh, a sample represents something more than 1,000 hectares. So that gives you some idea of the confidence that we're talking about. Um, there's a total of 161,000 samples that we've looked at and there's, that is, comprises about 67,000 samples from the 10 to 20 and the 20 to 30 centimetre layers. So if you take all of that information, as I've just explained to you, and chart it up in terms of the proportion of samples, so the same information that I had on the table earlier, we can see that for the 0 to 10 centimetre layer, for looking at pH less than 5.5, the, the very dark colour, 75 to 100% of the samples that we've collected out of that zone have come back with a pH less than the target. That's a, a pretty alarming rate for a lot of this land. And the next one is category 50% to 75% of the samples coming back under the target. And that pretty much covers the rest of the area, apart from a couple of patches, like you might have the uh, salmon gums, alkaline soils. Uh, north of Esperance area, and there's a few little patches up here with the, where we're somewhere between 20 and 50 percent of the samples have uh, been below the target. So that's pretty startling picture. I mean, I think it's something that we've understood pretty clearly, but this 
intensification of, of sampling and of you know, interrogation of the data is um, something that's perhaps not been quite so uh, um, closely known by, by a lot of other people. Um, we've done the same analysis but looked at what happens if you look at just pH less than 5. And you, overall you can see, and as you'd expect, this map on the, on the right hand side is um, quite a bit lighter than the, uh, than the one on the, the left hand side. To me that's heartening because what it means is that there's quite a lot of land out there, quite a lot of samples that, would, that have been collected um, that represent the land out there that need perhaps you know, one to two tonnes of lime per hectare um, to get up above that 5.5 and that's something that people should really be targeting at in conjunction with when they know their subsurface layers. So we'll go to those subsurface layers now, the 10 to 20 centimetre layer and the 20 to 30 centimetre layer. And perhaps I'll just make a, an important comment here that um, it, we think it's very important when, when growers are sampling that they sample that, those sort of depth layers rather than soil horizon layers. If you were to sample from 10 to 30 or 10 to 40 centimetres because it looks like it's the same soil, you're going to miss some pretty important information in terms of the pH levels because pH is something that changes down the profile no matter what the soil is. And you'll see that in the sort of case study example that I'll show shortly, but bear that in mind for me. So 10 to 20 centimetres, pH less than 4.8. This is our target here because that really wants to aim to keep farmers away from pH 4.5. And, and you've already seen, if you went to talks by uh, Craig and Mike Wong the other day, the importance of keeping away from that pH 4.5. That's where aluminium becomes uh, soluble in the soil solution. It becomes toxic to the plant roots. So we really want to be keeping away from that layer. So again, we can pick out areas of naturally deep acidic soils, but we're also finding areas that we probably wouldn't have expected so much, an area largely around Katani. Um, it's been farmed for a long time, probably doesn't have a good history of lime use down that way. Um, so some quite uh, high numbers of low pH samples coming out and also with, on, we're seeing uh, in the northern wheat belt areas um, a large number of samples from the 20 to 30 centimetre layer, high proportions of those coming back well below the, the targets that we're aiming for. Okay, I want to move on now, sort of established a, a sort of a wide picture, I want to hone in just to, to one paddock, one patch of paddock. Um, late last year in October we had a visit from uh, some of the caring for our country people from, from DAF in Canberra to just have a review and see what we were achieving in the project. We went out and talked to Tony White, who's the, Tony White, who's the uh, farmer kneeling down looking in the hole um, at his farm near, near Myling. Um, we were chatting to him about how our, our sampling process and things had been worked and he said, if you've got a few minutes, come down and have a look at this area in the, in the paddock. And, what he had done is put three tonnes of lime per hectare on the, on the paddock. Um, he realised that he had a subsurface problem and he wanted to mix that lime in through the soil and try and get it down into that area. And he'd left a patch out that sort of ran largely from sort of out here across around the windmill and back down that way somewhere um, because he didn't want to run over the, the windmill pipe and he didn't really know where it was. So. There was an area there where we where were looking that hadn't had, or still had lime on, but it hadn't been spaded in. So Joel Ander and I went out there in um, November and we took some, some crop cuts. As you can see, at the end of October, the crop was, was finished. Um, we, we took some uh, harvest cuts to get some, some yield measurements. And we also took some replicate samples um, down the soil pH profile. And what I've done is plot all eight reps that we took to show you the sort of natural variation and spread. So in the surface where the lime had been on, there was, so this is the, uh, the not spaded treatment. pH is down in the surface, down almost four and a half, up to almost six. Next layer down, there's still quite a spread from four up to somewhere about 4.7. And then 20 to 30, and this is what I'm saying about how you, you need to sample those different depths. It's a clear illustration there. Um, that that zone there, still the same soil type, um, pH is well down around the four, so you can see that just over on that area. Um, that's what I'm talking about. Sorry to the people that are over on 
my left here. Um, the important thing to note from this chart is that the pH then increases as we get down below 40 centimetres back up to around about 5 as a, as a rough average. Now I've plotted on the pHs that we took using um, exhaust tube and um, sampling every 10 centimetres of, so in the, in the greenish colour of the spade of treatments and as you'd expect the variability has increased a lot. The surface is still pretty much the same. 10 to 20 which is the sort of working depth and 20 to 30 which are working depths of the, of the spader. There's now a reasonable spread and it's been an increase. pH in our samples are still fairly low in the 30 to 40 centimetre because there wasn't much mixing going on there. And then the rest of the samples sort of all fit within that nat natural variability. So that's a picture of the unspaded soil profile down to 50 centimetres. And you can see there's uh, you know, a colour change with the topsoil. And then, as I showed you, the, the, the yellow sand underneath is, is pretty uniform, but within there you've got some stark differences in terms of pH, as I showed you on the chart. This is the area just adjacent to that, an example of where the um, Soil has been spaded in, the topsoil has been spaded in, so I'll just show you where. Uh, just get my bearing right. That's a 30 centimetre depth there. So you can see the topsoil has been spaded in. It's showing up sort of a purplish colour here. Um, that's because we've sprayed, sprayed it with the sort of pH indicator dye, which reacts with the, the lime and reacts to the pH of the soil and, and gives you a good indication of where that, uh, the pHs are changed. But there's also, this is in terms of the spading mechanism for mixing in, there's a, a sort of a greenish tinge through this area and that also means uh, an increased pH. So there's been a mixing of a certain amount of soil and lime in this area as well. So we don't have stark delimitations of, uh, of plus or minus you know, topsoil from the spading um, process. But you can see how mixed up this surface is. So where why we got the variability. If we'd taken a soil core from here, we'd have got some acid soil and some lime soil, and then, you know, if we'd taken a core out of here or here, and, and those cores that we took to show you the charts were a sort of a, a random um, locations. So you can see that variability. So I'm going to let the, the, the actual crop and the roots interpret that soil pH profile for us. So looking at the non spaded. Um, treatment. You can see there are roots that have been sort of picked out of the soil profile here down to 23 centimetres and in October when we visited and when we took these photographs um, to, show, to show our visitors um, the crop had senesce so these are dry roots but below 23, 25 centimetres on the unspaded treatment there was still plenty of moisture. Still plenty of moisture in this sand that was unused. When you go over to the spaded treatment, they've still got an abundance of roots down here at 40 centimetres and there were other roots still going down beyond that, down past the 50, metre, uh, 50 centimetre layer. So, and what was startling to the visitors and to Tony was that the um, wheat on the spaded treatment had dried this profile down to 50 centimetres, which was as deep as we dug uh, on that day. Unfortunately, after we saw that and we talked to Tony in the, in, the, um, in the paddock, we resolved to go and do some of these measurements that I'm showing you. But within the space of four days, they'd had 28 mils of rain that they'd have dearly loved to have had a couple of weeks earlier. Um, so it, it wet up the profile again. So this is water content of the samples that we took um, in mid-November when we got back to do the sampling. Um, so both profiles very similar down to about 40 odd centimetres but then the um, profile which is spaded was different and drier down to a metre where we took the samples down to than the, than the unspaded. So clearly the spaded treatment had taken more water out of this zone um, and, and we know it did there although I don't have the, the numbers but I'm showing you this because I think it's important um, just to, you know, to tell it the way it is. The, the clear importance or clear 
difference between this water use during the season and the, and the crop growth was that the unspaded treatment yielded just over 0.8 of a tonne um, with the error bar there and the spaded treatment yielded just over one and a half tonnes with the error bar there. So um, it's a chalk and cheese sort of comparison. That sort of yield difference, we've been talking about economics and costs and things like that, that sort of yield difference would actually have paid for the process of putting that three tonne of lime out plus the, um, the operation of spading the lime in. Not only that, that profile that I showed you is sitting there it's going to be doing good. It's going to be still working further down the profile, changing the pH. It's going to be increasing yield for the next few years to come. So um, it, it's not something that's just a one-off hit. And we've seen that with lots of, lots of trials, and I'm not just giving you more Lyme results. So I thought this is something that's probably a lot of people are going to be thinking of in the, in the near future. OK, that's enough of those results and things. Just move on now to um, give a thanks few more minutes, that's great. Um, just give a, a plug for um, a, a line profit calculator that's been developed by um, Farmanco, Rob Sands and Nadine Hollenby at the Libby Group. Uh, they've largely used a lot of the information that's been generated by the department over the years but have put an economic focus and front end onto it so that when growers um, go through the, the spreadsheet model um, they're able to put in their expected yield differences so they can clearly state that over time if they do nothing the yields will decline, if they put lime on then the yields will increase and by putting those things together um, and putting their real costs of uh, either liming and or um, their production costs together we can um, get some figures so you can either as advisors or as farmers you can uh, start to get an idea of what lime is worth, because we, we know that it's an ep economic um, activity that you should be doing, it's economically profitable, but it has to be viewed in a long-term um, context. I thought I'd put this up with a, I work with the, with the lime industry. Um, they confidentially provide me with their sales figures which I can then amalgamate and show how um, lime use has been tracking over the years. In this case, I've gone back to 2005 and we were somewhere under or around 400,000 tonnes. And over the last, sort of up to, up to last year, 2012, we were just over a million tonnes uh, of lime being used in the, in the WA wheat belt. And that pretty much, I mean, there's a couple of uh, lime suppliers that choose not to give me my figures or give me their figures. Um, but that's a pretty good representative of the overall trend of, of how lime use has been going. And most people would be fairly pleased with that sort of uh, uh, growth rate and adoption rate. I've plotted the same figures in green, but now I've put in the lime rate in pink that we think or believe is required Two and a half million tonnes is required for each year for the next 10 years to actually get those profiles that I showed you in the maps up to the target. Now, I don't think we're going to get there over that 10 years. We're not going to suddenly get lime use up to two and a half million tonnes. But, um, you know, we, we've definitely got to improve it or we've got to be very much more precise and uh, effective about where the lime is going. So last year I told you that most people put out one tonne of lime per hectare as a blanket application across a paddock. We really need to refine that information using the soil depth information, um, get the lime, uh, the lime being used most effectively where it is going out. So that's the key messages. I think I've just poked an extra one in there. But um, soil acidity is a major constraint. That's not changed, but I think it is being recognised, particularly with the new work they'll be doing. Um, Lime use is less than it, uh, than it should be. And I guess when, when things get a bit more desperate, um, people start looking for alternatives or for silver bullets and things like that. And um, we've heard it in, in weed stuff this morning that you know, there aren't any silver bullets. You know, and I think probably the main thing is stick to the, the, the true science and there aren't any silver bullets in solution. You know, ask some questions if you're told differently on different products and things. Um, and people can give you advice on how to assess them. Um, 
and I guess hopefully you've seen that you know, farm scale information for farmers to use has also been useful for us to have a full context. So I'll stop there. Thanks, Kit. Thanks very much, Chris. Uh, we've, we've got time for some questions before we break for morning tea. Got a couple of mics wandering around. So, any questions? No, back. Have you done any work um, with different methods of incorporation of lime? Uh, I mean, with a lot of people moldboarding these days, and I imagine applying large rates of lime before they do that, do you know how the incorporation compares to the spading that, was, uh, that you've illustrated? Yeah, I think I couldn't hear quite clearly, but I think the question was about uh, different methods of incorporation of lime. Yeah. Um, yes, we have. I mean, we go back to early 2000s, and uh, Dave Gartner and I did work in the department about injecting lime in behind deep rippers, so having a, an airflow to carry lime in and inject it into that subsurface depth. It works, but it came with quite a lot of caveats. You know, you had to drive slowly, it was expensive, and if you got it wrong, you wasted a lot of money because the lime was spread down. What you're really looking for is a, a, a spread of lime through that soil profile to allow the roots pathway through to that often better soil that's deeper down. Um, and I'd use the spading as an example because that's probably one of the best examples I've seen of getting a, a mixture of lime through that depth. Maybe it needed to be a little bit deeper in that example. Um, we've done some, and Steve Davis will probably talk about some, um, with looking at moldboard ploughing. Um, again, any disturbance that you do, I'd encourage people to be putting some lime on and getting it mixed in. The, a good moldboard plough job to bury weed seeds is probably a bad job of incorporating lime because you turn it right over and still end up with acid on the surface. Um, a bad job of moldboard ploughing where the soil is only sort of partially flipped is actually a good job of incorporating lime. So, um, yeah. I think there's another. I was just wondering if you'd looked at uh, how much lime was estimated to be left in WA. We obviously need a, a lot of it. Has there been any figures done on reserves? There, there have been studies done on the reserves. Um, I guess probably the most recent thing is, I don't know the, the actual tonnages, but um, there's a sort of a 50-year lime supply strategy where they've looked at which resources are available. Um, obviously, as it gets used up, uh, those resources decline or that you try and get into more sensitive areas which ecologically people don't want to happen so you'd have to revert to getting lime from further away. There are lime sources you know to the east and the north of the wheat belt but they're a lot further on than the coastal supplies that you've got. Um, yeah I, I don't know the actual figures but uh, suffice it to say if agriculture is using a million tonnes um, of lime in it per year. Construction, so building of houses, building of limestone walls, building of railways, you know, down the freeway, those sort of things use a lot more limestone than what is going into agriculture. Mining use a lot more of the resource as well. So I guess my advice is maybe agriculture get in and get their share before others who are prepared to pay a lot more um, go and, you know, use up all the easy pickings if you like. There's one here, Glenn. Thanks. Yeah, Chris, um, obviously, you know, it's a, it's a massive problem, and what worries me is the eastern wheat belt. Um, the economics sur surrounding the farms these days, they're, you know, you said it yourself, they're not going to get there in 10 years, and that's for the whole, whole industry. Um, like, I don't see it to be a, an individual's problem anymore, it's more of a state problem. And when is the government going to recognise that and, and lobby maybe for subsidised transport? Yeah, I probably would have to say that I can't comment on government things at the moment, being in caretaker mode, so um, there are probably other people that can, can talk on that, so it's probably safe I don't, don't say a comment. Chris, um, at the start you touched on the total cost. I think it was net cost to the state of $500 million per year, a rough estimate. Um, if you crunch all the numbers and work out an optimum application rate, the cost of application, transport, etc., what's the, what's the, the difference between the, the costs and the net remedi remi remediation cost? What's the difference? Um, probably like to pass that over to the economist. Rob's sitting down there. Um, look, I, 
we know that it is profitable. We know that it returns more than it costs and because it's a, a long-term analysis. Once you've fixed the profile, then you are continuing to get those benefits. Um, I guess the thing that probably people don't often factor in is that um, it's not against a steady line. You're not going, if you're yielding you know, two tonne now and you don't put any lime on, you're not going to be yielding two tonne in 10 years' time. You're going to continue to acidify the soil and your yields will get a, a penalty um, to that increased acidification. So the gap widens between what you apply and treat and, and get a benefit now compared to in, in years' time for doing nothing, that, that gain gets bigger. So, um, look, I have to say I, I don't know how to put an economic figure onto it, but I just know that those yields get ever increasingly more profitable. Um, Long-term lime trials that we've got examples of, you know, uh, where the profile is fixed compared to one that doesn't meet the targets, are still yielding, you know, three, four, five hundred kilos on a ton, ton and a half, two ton crop. Um, so they're just paying for themselves year after year once they're fixed. But to fix that um, acidified profile now that hasn't had any lime obviously costs a lot more. Okay, thanks Chris. Uh, our time's up, so I'd like you all to thank Chris for his presentation. It's been excellent. Mm -hmm. So, we've got a little bit of homework uh, before we move off.